In this video, we're doing a deep dive into the world of garlic, one of the most used and loved aromatic ingredients on the planet. And based on the length, you'll see, this video is packed with graphics, three different taste test experiments, and answers to every question you could possibly have when it comes to garlic. This includes, why do humans love garlic? Why does it burn so fast? What's the best way to store garlic? Does jarred garlic taste that much different than fresh? What about garlic paste or garlic powder? We'll talk about how you can change the intensity of raw garlic, or depending on how you cook it, you can completely change the taste of garlic. This isn't garlic 101, 201, 301, or even garlic 405. By the end of this video, you'll have an honorary garlic PhD. And the best part is, all this information can instantly be applied the next time you use garlic at home. So, where does our journey begin? Well, in the ground, because we need to learn how garlic is actually grown. Before we get deep into the testing and test candidates, we need to first understand what is garlic, how is it grown, and why is it almost universally loved around the world? Garlic is an allium grown by propagating single clothes, which grow back into a full head with a sprouting stalk and flower, and this is known as a garlic scape. Any emerging scapes are cut off before they can flower, so the plant can send all its energy back down to the bulb and produce more cloves. And eventually, the stalks begin to wither and brown, at which point the bulb is plucked out of the ground for harvest, and they are ready for curing. Now, I didn't know that the garlic we buy at the grocery store is actually cured, but it's a super important process that begins to explain why garlic is used in so many cuisines around the world. To cure the garlic, the excess soil is brushed off from the harvested bulbs, and they are then strung up to hang in a dry, well-ventilated area for about two to four weeks, during which two important changes happen. First, the outer layers of the bulbs dry, which forms a protective, papery skin. And secondly, the flavors of the cloves themselves intensify during these couple of weeks. Because that papery, protective skin forms, this means that garlic and other alliums like onions and shallots are a readily available year-round crop that could be stored for weeks and months at a time in warehouses, supermarket shelves, and right in your pantry. Speaking of, do you know the best way to store garlic? Well, for optimal storage, whole garlic heads should be stored in a cool, dark place like your pantry, not the fridge or counter, because excess moisture or light will speed up molding and sprouting. And without this cured dry protective layer, garlic cloves actually mold and spoil really fast. I know peeling garlic can be a pain, but keeping those heads or cloves intact helps preserve them. For example, have you ever seen these packs of pre-peeled garlic? While they seem super convenient, I bought them like twice in my life and have been completely burned both times. I use like a third of the bag pretty quick, but then I just toss it into the fridge and then it gets moldy really quickly, much faster than a whole head of garlic just in my pantry. And I know that I can't be the only one who has been burnt on those pre-peeled cloves. The one caveat is if you need a lot of garlic fast and have a specific use case, this might be what you grab. For example, a lot of restaurants will use this, but it's really hard to use up all these garlic cloves at home unless you make some garlic confit, which I'll show you a bit later. Now, pre-peeled garlic poses another problem, and that is it allows the garlic aromas and flavors to quickly fade to the air. And this brings us to understanding the flavor qualities of fresh garlic. Did you know that you can change the flavor intensity of garlic depending on how you prepare it? You see, just like onions, leeks, and shallots, garlic's flavor is released when the cells are damaged, and the more cells that are damaged, the more of the signature flavor is released. For example, here are five different prepped garlic cloves. One is peeled whole, one is crushed in half, one is sliced, one is minced, and one is grated into a paste. Now, garlic's flavor compounds are primarily fat-soluble. So, if you were to mix in some room temperature olive oil or melted butter into these, then strained off the garlic solids and dipped in some bread into the oil, you're gonna have five wildly different experiences. The garlic sickos are gonna love the pungent, tingly bite from the oil made with the garlic paste, while the oil made with the whole peeled clove is gonna taste like no garlic was ever used. Whoa. This is actually super cool. Like this 
just tastes like olive oil. You'd have no idea that it was sitting with a clove of garlic, whereas the one that was paste and mixed up, but still strained off, it's imparted with all of those flavors of garlic and you actually get that really pungent bite. And the key to understand is the more cells that are damaged, the more flavor is released. However, before you run out to buy some jarred garlic or make a batch of garlic paste for yourself to save you from the shackles of peeling garlic for dinner, the flavor of fresh garlic is fleeting due to two variables, temperature and time. According to the science of cooking, at room temperature, the amount of allicin in a damaged clove peaks at around 60 seconds and then mellows as the allicin and other molecules break down into more complex flavors. And secondly, at above 140 degrees Fahrenheit, or 60 C, the allicin generating enzymes are completely deactivated. Meaning, some garlic that you chopped yesterday is going to taste less garlicky than a clove you chopped a minute ago. And also, a cooked garlic clove will taste very different than a raw garlic clove. Now first, you may be wondering, who is Allison and what does she have to do with garlic? But more importantly, while it may be true that garlic flavor peaks at 60 seconds after chopping, what I want to know is how much of a difference does it actually make? Like how different is granulated garlic compared to jarred garlic or garlic paste when I actually cook with it? And in theory, these are all going to have slightly different tastes, so that's exactly why I wanted to do three side-by-side -side taste tests with a raw application and two cooked versions. One where garlic is a main flavor character, and one where garlic is a supporting flavor character. Now, before we get to the test, it's critical to understand the three fundamental flavor attributes that raw garlic has. But first, let me tell you about my favorite olive oil, which is a recurring character in this video from today's sponsor, Graza. I'll keep this simple. I like Graza for these three reasons. First, it's really great olive oil at a fair price. I actually used Graza as one of the test candidates in the olive oil deep dive video five months ago, and it competes right on par with far more expensive options. Reason number two is their dedication to transparency and olive oil education. As I learned, buying olive oil at the store can be really confusing, and Graza makes it really easy to understand. Their extra virgin olive oil is made with single origin piqual olives that is never blended, but depending on when the olives are picked, leads to two very different oils. For example, you'll understand why I use the drizzle as a finishing oil for the panzanella test and the sizzle oil I use for cooking in the alio e olio test. And reason number three, the squeeze bottle is a nice quality of life improvement that makes you feel like a chef in the kitchen. So if you want to try Graza for yourself, head to the link in my description to purchase the drizzle and sizzle combo pack. And thank you again, Graza, for sponsoring this video. At a high level, these six properties make up the flavor of food. Taste, aroma, texture, physical reaction, sight, and the human element. And when it comes to analyzing the flavor of fresh garlic, the three most important to think about are taste, aroma, and physical reaction. And let's start with taste because for raw garlic, it's actually the least important factor. Garlic in its raw form doesn't have a lot of taste, but it does have a lot of aroma and pungency. Both we'll talk about in a moment. Technically, raw garlic does have molecules that make it taste sweet, bitter, and slightly umami, but you would only notice these if you could completely plug your nose and isolate the taste receptors from the dominant aroma that you are taking in. I'm gonna regret this one, but here we go. <clears throat> Woo! That'll wake you up. That will wake you up. Mm. As Harold McGee from On Food and Cooking explains, there are only a handful of different tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and savory, or umami, while there are thousands of different odors. And it's odor molecules that make an apple taste like an apple, not like a pear or radish. If our nose is blocked by a cold or pinching fingers, it's hard to tell the difference between an apple and a pear, so most of what we experience as flavor is actually odor or aroma. Now, while taste is the least important factor in raw garlic, as I hinted earlier, the flavor of garlic can completely change when we cook it. 
Cooking garlic causes it to lose a lot of the aromatic compounds and pungency that raw garlic does, but depending on how you cook it, it can create new aromatic compounds and also new tastes. We'll talk a little bit more about this in experiments two and three, but for example, because garlic has a high sugar content in the form of fructose, it actually becomes sweeter as it browns and caramelizes. And we'll demonstrate this in a garlic confit example coming up. However, if you cook garlic too long, those sucrose sugars can burn, which makes them go bitter. And this is why burnt garlic can completely ruin a dish. So while for raw garlic, taste is not really a factor, most of us love garlic for its garlicky aroma and physical tingly sensation in the mouth known Whoa. as pungency. And here's how these two work. In these various studies, there have been 125 individual aroma compounds identified in raw and heated garlic cloves. And these aroma compounds generally fall into two categories. 85 are sulfur-containing compounds and 40 are non-sulfur-containing compounds. And the sulfur-containing compounds are what give garlic its signature garlic aroma that we all know and love. And there is one specific aroma molecule from the thiosulfonates that is the key and you should be able to guess, this is allicin. Allicin is an organosulfur compound or a distinct sulfur-containing structure that is responsible for the signature aroma of garlic. But interestingly enough, allicin isn't actually present in whole garlic, but it's formed through an enzymatic reaction when the cloves are cut, crushed, or minced. So how exactly does allicin form? Well, the allyn sulfurous molecules is kept separate from the allynase enzyme in the intact structure of a garlic clove. However, when the garlic cell walls are ruptured, the two come into contact to form the pungent allicin. Thus, the more garlic cells that are crushed and ruptured, the more these two compounds are brought together and the more allicin is produced, resulting in a much stronger garlic aroma and pungency. And this is exactly what we saw earlier with the whole crushed, minced, and paste garlic. Now again, there's two things to keep in mind here. The amount of allicin peaks at around 60 seconds before mellowing out over time. And secondly, at above 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the allicin-generating enzymes are deactivated. And this is why raw garlic gives us that fiery irritation that us garlic sickos love, but it's not present after cooking garlic. This brings us to the physical reaction side of things where we have two questions to answer. One, why does garlic cause us irritation? And secondly, from a psychological perspective, why do humans like food that cause pain and irritation? All alliums do have sulfurous pungent compounds whose original purpose was actually to deter animals from eating them. However, humans did not agree. And pungency is neither a taste or smell, but actually a general feeling of irritation that verges on pain. And very reactive sulfur-containing compounds in the mustard and onion families apparently do mild damage to the unprotected cell membranes in our mouth and nasal passages. Garlic specifically produces a hundredfold higher concentration of pungent sulfurous reactions when its cell walls are ruptured compared to milder alliums like leeks or onions. Now, if that's true, you may be wondering why do onions make people cry, but not garlic? Well, some alliums contain different sulfur compounds known as lacrimators, which in high concentration cause irritations to human, most notably making people cry when they get released through cutting or crushing the cell walls. However, lacrimators are only present in onions, shallots, leeks, and chives, but not in garlic. Garlic's main compound is allicin, which thankfully doesn't make us cry, but it does cause that pleasant tingling. Which leads me to the next question, why do humans like food that cause us pain and irritation? For example, why do we enjoy the sting of wasabi, ginger, garlic, hot peppers, or eating a spicy bag of chips? Well, it turns out that eating spicy or pungent foods is kind of like going on a roller coaster or jumping into a frigid lake. While pungent and spicy foods do send signals of pain and irritation to our brain, our minds recognize that this situation isn't truly dangerous. So when on a roller coaster or eating a spicy curry, we savor those stimulating sensations for their own sake and find pleasure and novelty in them.
And then after eating these types of food, as noted in On Food and Cooking, the sensation of pain may also cause pain-relieving body chemicals that leave a pleasant glow when the burning fades. And additionally, we may also enjoy spicy food because irritation adds a new dimension to the experience of eating. In other words, pungent garlic is stimulating in a dish. It makes our food less boring. And I'm thinking we should probably do a deep dive into spicy and irritating foods. But first, let's put some of this garlic theory that we've been learning about to the test. So remember, we have only been zoomed in on using garlic raw because these flavors can change substantially when they're cooked. So before we dive into the cooked garlic, I want to use raw garlic in a side-by-side -side taste test. However, instead of testing chopped versus paste versus sliced, that's more of a personal preference thing based on your love for garlic. I wanted to test fresh garlic against some of the convenient prepared options to see how much of a difference there actually is between something like fresh garlic, jarred garlic, and granulated. So I did that by making one of my favorite summer salads, panzanella. For this test, I made one big batch of panzanella components by slicing up a crusty loaf of sourdough bread into thick sheets, then into planks, and lastly into cubes before tossing them into a bowl. Next, I sliced a bunch of cherry tomatoes in half using the deli lid trick before adding a big sprinkle of salt to internally season them and draw out excess moisture. Lastly, I sliced up one fourth of a red onion into slices, and after prepping this, I tossed the bread into a bowl along with the tomatoes, onions, some fresh sliced basil, and some shaved Parmigiano Reggiano. Now the raw garlic comes into play with the vinaigrette. So for the vinaigrette, I set a jar over a scale and poured in the tomato juices from the salted tomatoes, 25 grams of white wine vinegar, and 100 grams of the Graza finishing olive oil. Then I gave that all a shake to emulsify it and just added a touch more vinegar to taste. I poured 20 grams of the vinaigrette into three separate bowls before adding the three different types of garlic. To one, I added one clove of fresh minced garlic. To the middle, I added the same size amount of the jarred garlic. And lastly, I added the granulated garlic to the last one before mixing each of them up. Then I separated the salad components into three different deli containers and added the different garlic vinaigrettes before shaking up the salads thoroughly and letting them sit for 15 minutes before doing the taste test. Let's blindfold up. I cannot wait to get into these. This is one of my favorite summer salads. Now, based on what we learned earlier, these were the questions I was thinking about during this test. First, how garlicky will the fresh garlic be after sitting for about 15 to 20 minutes? Because remember, even though I haven't cooked this garlic, the allicin and pungency will mellow over time. And secondly, is the jarred or granulated garlic a decent substitute for fresh garlic when used in a raw application? Tastes really good. That one smells like pretty garlicky to me. Now, as soon as I opened the second container, it smelled completely different than the garlic flavor in the first container. However, I did incorrectly identify it. Oh. <laughs> I can already tell, this is definitely the jarred garlic. It smells exactly like the, the jarred garlic. Like whatever whatever's in the jarred garlic, this is exactly what it smells like. It's gotten that very distinctive like smell and like whatever it's packed in, it, it's very distinctive and that is definitely the jarred garlic. When I got to the third container, I wasn't really getting much garlic flavor at all. I was just tasting the other components but then when I went back to the first container, it was even clearer that this was the fresh garlic because of that pungent tingle. In this test, supremely obvious which one is which. I, I'll put money down, like fresh, jarred, granulated, no question. This fresh one, you get the little tingle around. So like if you love that garlic, you're going to get that. Now my microphone died before I got rid of my blindfold and I ended up talking to the camera for a couple of minutes where I recapped my key observation from this test, which was the fresh garlic was the only one that caused the physical reaction of pungency on my lips and it was easily my favorite and I was able to clearly identify it. But ultimately, this test left me wanting to figure out three questions. One, why did the jarred garlic taste the least garlicky of all three? Two, why did the granulated garlic change flavors so significantly that it confused me? And three, how will these garlic flavors change when I use them in a cooked recipe? 
So before we get into experiments two and three, we need to do some digging into how these form factors are actually made and if they're ultimately worth keeping in our pantry. Because after this first test, I'm definitely not impressed. These are the four common garlic products you'll likely find at the grocery store. Obviously, number one is fresh garlic. Two is dehydrated garlic, such as garlic powder or granulated garlic. Three is jarred garlic, which is in a water-based solution. And fourth is garlic paste, which is usually in a tube and is primarily mixed with oil. Now, obviously, these aren't going to taste exactly like fresh garlic, but instead, the selling point is convenience. And you can almost envision the TV infomercial for this, where there's one guy struggling with the papery fresh garlic and mincing it up, while the guy next to him opens up his cool looking jar and throws a spoonful of already chopped garlic into his pan. Now, after the first test, there's no way I would substitute the jarred garlic for the fresh stuff, but remember, cooking could change that whole equation in experiments two and three. So let's actually take a look at what's inside each of these garlic products. One of the most popular forms of garlic is in dried form, either powdered, granulated, or minced. And gram per gram, dried garlic powder actually has a stronger singular flavor than fresh garlic because the drying process completely removes the moisture and concentrates the essential garlic aromas. However, the flavor of dried garlic powder is slightly different from fresh garlic. While it still has the garlic flavor, some of the more delicate aromas like allicin may be lost during drying, making the flavor less complex than fresh. And it's a similar concept to how imitation vanilla is made with super high concentrations of vanillin, while real vanilla has a wider range of aroma compounds. Now, you may be wondering, does it matter if you buy powder, granulated, or minced dry garlic? Are they basically all the same? Well, they are similar, but I actually think the minced dried garlic might be the best option for home cooks. Let me explain. Dried garlic products can be made by freeze drying or dehydrating garlic at low enough temperatures below 140 degrees so the allicin producing enzymes won't be deactivated. And you can find dried garlic in the following form factors. The finest texture is garlic powder. And true garlic powder is ground to a fine flour-like consistency, and it spreads easily throughout the dishes. However, because of this, it loses its aroma quickly due to more surface area being exposed to oxygen. And if you buy this, you want to make sure you keep it sealed in a dark place and use it up within a few months. And you can check out my spice guide and storing guide for more info on this. The middle texture is granulated garlic. Now, sometimes at the store, granulated garlic is also called garlic powder, but it's ground a tiny bit coarser to about a sand consistency. And this is the Goldilocks of dried garlic, probably what most of you have at home and what I'm used to using. However, that may change because of form factor three, and that is minced dried garlic. These are the coarse pieces of garlic like you would find on an everything bagel. And you can think of them as the whole peppercorns of garlic powder, which have two unique benefits. First, versatility. These can be used whole or you can crush them up into a powder before using. And secondly, longer storage. Whole spices in general stay fresh for longer than fine ground powders due to less exposed surface area and volatility. So unless you are using the powder from earlier very often, this, in my opinion, is the best version for home cooks. Now, when it comes to using dried garlic products in your cooking, it really helps if you activate them or simply put, rehydrate them. So America's Test Kitchen recommends mixing garlic powder in a bit of water before cooking with it, which makes for a much more potent end product. And adding dried garlic straight to oil or butter means it won't get a chance to rehydrate and release its maximum flavor. Now, you don't actually have to pre-mix it in a little bowl of water, as garlic powder will often rehydrate during the cooking process when it comes into contact with wet ingredients. For example, in the panzanella test, it rehydrated with the tomato water and vinegar in the vinaigrette. And this is my theory on why I confuse the jarred garlic and the granulated. I was used to smelling the jarred garlic in the watery solution from the jar, and it simulated a very similar smell to the granulated garlic in the panzanella salad after it had been rehydrated. And surprisingly, the granulated garlic tasted more garlicky than the jarred stuff. 
And if you smell hydrated garlic paste right next to the jarred garlic paste, it's actually crazy how similar they are. Because dried garlic products are most flavorful when they are rehydrated, this allows that allicin to reawaken. Now, in experiment number two, the granulated garlic will be rehydrated with the pasta water in the pan, but I also ground the jarred garlic into a paste to see if I could get it to release more flavor. However, before we jump into those tests, let me quickly explain what jarred garlic and tubed garlic paste are. So why is jarred garlic a thing? Again, this likely arose out of consumer demands for pre-prepped ingredients and as a way to preserve garlic. So how's it made? Well, jarred garlic is essentially pickled. It's pre-minced and then preserved in a water and citric acid solution. And if you taste this liquid alone, it's pretty sour. Unfortunately, the acid breaks down the allicin and garlic flavors over time. And while the garlic won't mold or spoil easily, it also doesn't retain its full flavor. I kind of realized that pickled onions and jarred garlic kind of have a lot of similarities because these smell oniony-ish, but I can literally eat a full bite of these no problem, and it really doesn't taste that much like onions. Now, the same thing happens with the jarred minced garlic. Now, will this change at all when it comes to cooking? I'm pretty skeptical, and I actually think this tube of garlic paste might be a much better option. So why is garlic paste a thing? Well, squirting garlic into the pan is pretty damn convenient, and this is popular in a number of cuisines. And here's how it's made. Essentially, there's two categories of this. There's water base, which is essentially the acidic jarred garlic, just in paste form. And secondly, we have oil based, and this is the one that I'm using for testing today. The version I have is an Italian product that is kept from oxidizing by using oil. And on the ingredient list, there is garlic, sunflower oil, salt, extra virgin olive oil, citrus fiber, and citric acid. And in theory, the oil-based paste probably work better than jarred because oils are really good at holding on to otherwise volatile aroma flavor molecules. So the oils in this product become infused with the garlic flavor, even though the garlic bits themselves may lose some of their potency over time. Thus, when you use paste in a dish, you can transfer the stored flavor into the dish via the oils that it's made with. Now, will this stuff live up to the box's claim of authentic Italian flavor? Well, there's no place to hide in this next test because Aglio e Olio is a pasta all about the flavor of garlic. Solid pasta, not super garlicky. For this test, I made several batches of Aglio e Olio, which is the classic pasta made with an emulsion of olive oil and salty pasta water that is flavored with garlic and parsley. The only thing I changed, the garlic form factor. So for this test, I use fresh garlic, jarred garlic, granulated garlic, and garlic paste. Now, because I only have room to make three batches at once on the stove, I had to split this into two separate tests. The first one is fresh versus jarred versus granulated, and the second is only fresh versus garlic paste, but it's a triangle test. Now, a triangle test is a blind evaluation of three relatively similar samples where you have to choose the outlier. So I made two bowls of fresh and two bowls of garlic paste, but then pulled one away and have to see if I can correctly identify which one is which. Maybe a little bit more garlic flavor coming into that one. So let me get to number three. Also, before some Italians start raising fists in the air and saying you should never use granulated garlic for a dish like this, remember, this is an exploration to try and observe how garlic changes when it is cooked and used as the primary flavoring or dish. And ultimately, these are the questions I'm looking to figure out. One, does the fresh garlic completely lose its pungent bite when cooked? Two, are there any decent substitutes for fresh garlic? Or three, maybe could a combination of these be good together? So let's hop into my observation for the first three bowls of pasta. Continuing its disappointing result from earlier in the panzanella, the jarred garlic let me down again. Solid tasting. I feel like I'm mostly getting parsley in that one. Not much garlic flavor. And again, this was made clear when I got to the next bowl where I was welcomed with those fresh garlic aromas. Definitely better than number one. More garlicky. It's, it's balanced with the parsley and the kind of garlicky flavor. Things got really interesting for me when I got to the last bowl. It tasted so garlicky, it almost felt artificial. Three is... Uh, 
garlicky, but almost like an artificial garlic. Like it feels like it's pumping the, the garlic out at you, which kind of makes me think this might be the granulated. So if I were ranking these, I think the middle one is the fresh garlic. It is the best, like pretty clearly. But the third one, I think this is granulated and I actually like this much better than number one, which I think is the jarred. I think you get, you get just get like no garlic flavor from this. Uh, if this is the jarred garlic, you just get no garlic flavor from it. So if you remember, the dried garlic options are very concentrated flavors. So when rehydrated in a dish like this, it's a super dominant garlic flavor with no complexity or freshness from the garlic clove. And after this test, my first conclusion is, I'm completely out on jarred garlic. Similar to how you wouldn't cook with pickled onions in place of raw onions, jarred garlic just has no place in being used for me. Now, before I talk about granulated, let's move to the fresh versus garlic paste test. Again, for this, I use the same exact method and recipe, except I use the prepared tube paste in one and the fresh ground garlic paste in the other. So will I be able to correctly identify the outlier here? Let's see. So for this taste test, I've got two bowls of the fresh, two bowls of the paste. I'm gonna blindfold, remove one, and then see if I can identify which one's the same and which one is different. Let's go. Remove that one. We got three left. Top in, number one. I chose to use garlic paste here because I thought it would be the hardest to identify. Solid pasta. Not super garlicky. Maybe a little bit more garlic flavor coming into that one. But let me get to number three. Initial, I think one and three are different. And after going through each of them, I made my final guess on which was which. Okay, so I think two and three are the same. And I think these are both the fresh garlic. Um, I feel like there's something in these that's like kind of missing, like this taste like garlic, but it feels like I'm missing some kind of of those fresh, like brighter aromas that I'm getting in two or three. So let's see how I did. I think two and three are the same. I think, and I think they're the fresh. I think one is the, uh, the prepared garlic paste. This was the garlic paste, so I call that correctly. Two, fresh, let's go. Three, fresh, let's go. So maybe unsurprisingly, I think fresh garlic is not really replaceable for this dish. However, I still learned a lot and here are my conclusions and questions that I still have. One, I'm out on jarred garlic, as I mentioned earlier. Two, fresh garlic does have an aromatic quality that is unmistakable. Three, granulated garlic does taste very garlicky, but you have to be careful not to use too much. And fourth, Granulated garlic could be used in combination with fresh garlic or garlic paste. And I actually made another batch of pasta with granulated garlic, garlic paste, and Parmigiano Reggiano as the flavoring for the sauce, and it was actually quite incredible. And one thing that America's Test Kitchen also recommended is mixing granulated garlic with your fresh garlic on garlic bread. Now, ultimately, experiment number two was completely focused on using garlic as the main character in the flavor of a cooked dish, and it's pretty easy to tell a difference. But my next question is this. What happens when garlic is used as a supporting flavor character instead of a main character? For example, granulated garlic is often used as one spice in amongst five or six others in a rub, or garlic paste may be used to a soup base or chili. Now, in order to answer that question, we need to first understand the two core questions that you should ask yourself every time you cook garlic. Question number one is what flavor of garlic do I want in my dish? And question number two, is garlic being used as a main character or supporting character? So one of the coolest things we haven't talked about with using fresh garlic cloves is how you can completely change how it tastes depending on how you cook it. For example, here are five different garlic samples with completely different tastes and aromas. First, we have raw garlic, which we know has a sharp garlic aroma and pungent bite. Secondly, freshly sauteed garlic has a medium garlicky aroma, no pungent bite, and actually starts to become slightly sweet. Third, we have toasted garlic slices. These are still garlicky, yes, but also nutty due to the browning of the natural sugars. Fourth, 
These are confit or roasted garlic cloves, which have a very mellow garlic aroma and are very sweet compared to fresh. And far out on the spectrum is black garlic. Now these are made by holding garlic cloves at a constant temperature of 130 degrees Fahrenheit for two to three weeks, rendering the cloves black as tar. And all of the characteristic sharp garlic flavor is gone and replaced with a molasses-like sweet and umami taste with a funky fermented garlic aroma. Now we could probably do a whole video trying out all the things you can do with black garlic, but this really shows all the ways that the flavor of garlic can change depending on how you cook it. Now, one point of caution, you can definitely go too far because garlic burns really fast. And if you have ever wondered why it burns so fast, here you go. According to On Food and Cooking, garlic has a much higher concentration of fructose and fructose change when compared to onions. And additionally, garlic bulbs contain just 60% water compared to the 90% in onion. And both of these make garlic prone to drying out very fast over caramelizing the sugars and ultimately becoming burnt. Now, burnt sugar compounds like garlic fructose taste really bitter once they have gone past their caramelized state, which is why it will completely ruin and overpower the flavor of a dish. So if you burn your garlic in most cases, it's probably best to completely start over. Okay, so question number one also extends to the garlic form factor. For example, maybe a punchy granulated garlic might be what you need in a rub for barbecue. And then after deciding that, question number two, is the garlic flavor a main character or a supporting character? So in the first two experiments, I would say we're using garlic as a main character. And to define that, I mean, I can clearly pick out the flavor of garlic. For example, even though there are several components in the panzanella salad, I'm really after that pungent bite, which only fresh garlic can provide. Additionally, in the aglio e olio test, it's really just garlic and the parsley. Now, other main character recipes could be garlic bread, garlic flavored hummus, garlic vegetable stir fry, or a garlicky rice. However, in most recipes, garlic is typically used as a supporting character where we want the aromatic qualities, but it's not the main flavor. So think about using sauteed garlic for a soup, stew, or chili, adding cloves of garlic to a braise, using garlic powder in a spice mix. And the question is, does it make a difference if you use prepared garlic like powder or tube in place of fresh in a dish where it's just playing a supporting role? Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the final taste test where we are making dania or cilantro chicken, which is a recipe I've been meaning to try out for a long time and thought this was the perfect occasion. So as a cilantro lover, I've been waiting to try this dish and I thought, let's, let's make it a taste test. I think they're all gonna be really, really good, but I'm curious, is there actually a difference between the fresh, the paste and the granulated garlic and how significant is that experience? Let's give it a taste. For this test, I made three identical batches of cilantro chicken, except with different garlic applications. I got rid of the jarred garlic completely and I'm using fresh garlic, tube garlic paste, and granulated garlic. The garlic is used in a ginger and lemon mixture that is rubbed directly onto the chicken before cooking. So I set a bowl over a blender and added a four inch piece of ginger cut into chunks, the juice from one half of a lemon, and a pinch of salt before blending that together into a paste. I then added the ginger mixture to my garlic candidates, fresh grated garlic, tube of paste, and the granulated, which will hydrate it once it comes together. Then I grabbed out two boneless chicken thighs each and added the ginger garlic mixture to the exterior. And as you can see, this is a very different use case for garlic because we haven't even made the sauce yet. For the sauce, get out the blender and add two Roma tomatoes chopped up, a couple of green chilies, a squirt of tomato paste, and half a bunch of cilantro, and lastly, some salt before blending that into a nice puree. Now, it doesn't look pretty, but this sauce is incredible in the cooked product. At the stove, I set three pans over high heat and added some neutral oil. Once hot, I added the garlic ginger pieces down and seared them. And as you can see, we are getting some nice roasted and toasted flavors of garlic, which are much different than the aglio e olio test. But more importantly, this cilantro sauce right here is the main flavor. After the chicken is seared, I poured the sauce over the chicken and let it bubble and reduce down. After a few minutes, the last step is to add some whole plain fat yogurt, which makes the sauce creamy and really rounds out the flavors. 
Then you just let that cook down until it's reduced. I chop the chicken into pieces and let's assemble. I added rice to three different bowls before adding on the cilantro chicken and a little fresh sprig of cilantro too. And with this test, I'm looking to answer this. One, do the dishes taste any different? And more importantly, if so, how different are they? I'm just enjoying it so much. I am like kind of forgetting to, can I actually like tell a difference? So right off the bat, this dish just tastes really good. However, when I got to the second one, I did notice a difference in the flavor. This one maybe tastes a little bit more vibrant and fresh a little bit. A lot of flavors going on in this. It's just really good. Yeah, I think number two is, is more sour than uh, number one. Ultimately, after tasting all three, mm. they taste great. But I am able to pick up on the difference in bowl number two. Man, they're all really good. Two, though, like pops a little bit more and, and more vibrant than, um, than one and two. Like all three of them are so good though. Like I, I don't feel like I'm missing anything in my enjoyment of these. Um, but number two, I think maybe, maybe that's the pace because I think the paste does have that sour quality to it. Um, but honestly, I don't feel like I'm missing like anything or it's like off the charts different. So I'm, I'm pretty curious to see like what these are. Number one was the, the paste. Number two, the fresh. So this, I did like this one the best. Um, and then number three, granulated. So this is pretty interesting. Number two, I liked the most. It was the fresh garlic. And it was kind of like fresher, brighter, I, I, sour. Maybe I wasn't identifying that correctly. I don't know. But there was a quality and, and number two that I picked out differently than kind of one and three. That being said, I don't feel like I'm missing the garlic, the fresh garlic with any of these. There are so many other components and ingredients in this dish that it's not gonna make or break the dish. Whereas like fresh cilantro versus dried cilantro, that's gonna make or break this dish. So here's my ultimate conclusion from this test. Just because it tastes different does not mean the others are bad. Remember, garlic's playing a supporting role here. Did the fresh garlic make the best dish to my taste? Yes, but just because it tastes different does not mean it's bad. It's playing that supporting role, and obviously you don't typically taste things side by side like this. So if someone served me these bowls and didn't tell me what they changed, I would never go, oh, the garlic is different. However, with experiments one and two, I probably would be able to pick out that difference. In the panzanella, the fresh garlic was the only one with the pungent tingly bite. And in the alio aolio, I've only made it with fresh garlic before, so that's what I'm used to, making the granulated taste almost artificial. So to wrap this video up, based on all that we have learned, let's answer this. Is there actually a substitute for fresh garlic? To answer the question plainly, I don't think there really is a substitute for fresh garlic. Just think about everything it can do. First, it's the only option if you want that pungent sting. You can control the intensity of raw garlic depending on how you prepare it. You can completely change the flavor of it depending on how you cook it. It naturally lasts a long time in its papery protective layer, and it's really cheap. I mean, removing the skin isn't this huge inconvenience that those jarred garlic infomercials may want you to believe. That being said, we also learned that granulated garlic or garlic paste can definitely have a place in dishes where you're not relying on garlic as the main character. Anyway, I think this is the longest video we've ever done and it was definitely a team effort. Spencer, my editor, did a ton of work pulling this whole edit together and then Keith, who writes our newsletter, also helped me a ton with the research and kind of helping me piece together this entire script. Also, thank you to Graza for sponsoring this video. That link is down below. And if you guys want more videos like this, I am happy to do them. I find them really fun. They do take a lot more work, but yes, they are very fun. So let me know down in the comments. Anyway, that will wrap it up for me. Hopefully you have learned everything you could possibly want to know about garlic, and I will catch you all in the next one. Peace, y'all. Mm, mm, mm. I don't know which one I want to finish first. <laughs>